Let's go to the flood now, okay? In Genesis chapter 7, and we're going to, in a few moments, actually read the entire seventh chapter. But before we do that, just get this perspective in your mind, because I believe Genesis 7 records for us what was probably the longest week in the history of the world. That longest week began with the loud thud when God closed the door on the ark. And that's what we're studying this morning, the ark and the significance of the ark. But it says God shut that door. And with that loud thud of the massive entrance to the ark slamming shut, no other means of exit other than a five-story plus drop from the top deck was available for Noah and his family. I mean, if you read closely, they were locked in that thing. It only had one entryway, and it slammed shut, not with human hands. So think about what it was like to be trapped inside of there. Day one, there were crowds milling around outside the ark, yelling, jeering, and saying, Hey, where's the flood, old Noah? Where is it? You know, he's inside, they're outside, and they're making fun. Day two, with growing animal smells inside and sounds as, remember, one of everything, two of everything, and sometimes uh, uh, seven pairs of everything were inside, so those growing animal smells and the sounds, and the second day passed slowly inside the ark. More yells, more jeers as the crowd outside the ark grew larger. As many people who were along the roads, who had followed the incredible river of animals that walked into the ark, uh, very, very mysteriously, just think about that stream of animals. They were kind of walking with a purpose toward that ark, and they stayed together in pairs. I mean, and that attracted attention. And they saw those animals cross old Noah's field and go up the ramp into that huge building that Noah had built for the past 120 years. Well, day three rolls around, and that was a hard day because nothing happened, except it was getting a little warm inside the ark by then with all those animals. And the animals, though, seem to probably be quieting down. I personally believe they probably went into some kind of hibernation uh, mode for that time. I mean, it's very common. There are lots of stories. In fact, uh, this week I read in a flood book about a man who moved from England to America and didn't know his cat had crawled into the back of his car in the trunk. And uh, when he shut the trunk, the cat was in there. And after the boat went across, and it took it uh, six weeks to finally get to his house, and he opened the trunk. The cat was just curled up in a semi-hibernation stage, and it got up and just was fine and was a little hungry and all. And I thought, boy, if cats can do it across the Atlantic, the whole ark can do it for that period of time. But day four through six passed with the constant heckling and drifting up the walls to the family quarters of the crowd as they mocked Noah. But then on day seven, remember, the ark sat there for seven days. Didn't, nothing happened. It was a very gripping, vivid picture to the people. But on day seven, a loud thud was heard on the roof of the ark, and then another massive drop of rain began to pelt the earth. And the flood that God promised Noah, and the flood that Noah had warned the world about, finally arrived. On the ground, it must have been very interesting, because a massive drop of water hit Mr. and Mrs. Scoffer. Mr. and Mrs. Scoffer had been sitting in their lawn chairs in their backyard, they had sat there on and off for over a hundred years, drinking and laughing, jeering their old neighbor and his kids who had gone off the deep end. This guy who lived next door to them was crazy. He had ruined their neighborhood. His farm was a construction site. He had made a massive 450-foot-long building. It was 75 feet wide, five stories high, in the middle of his pasture. And when he wasn't out there dragging wood around, he was loudly preaching at everyone who gathered to watch him. And he said some crazy disaster was coming. He said water was going to fall on us and cover us up. They thought that was ridiculous. He claimed some deity somewhere was offended by our demon worship, our drunkenness, and our murder. Just then, another wet object Slapping Mrs. Scoffer awake, knocked her out of her lawn chair. She had been dozing, kind of recovering after the effects of last night's revelry. In fact, most of the hundreds of milling townspeople were still red-eyed from the party the night before. 
It was almost exactly seven days since Noah and all his family had gone up that ramp into their wooded building. And some say, those that were sober, the ramp had lifted itself up and sealed to the ark. All we know out here is that this building has no visible entrance left. And now it's getting hard to see that building because the sky has grown so dark. And those animal sounds were the only sound of life coming from inside that ark from that little small window around the top. And all of the people had their mocking banter going when those huge clear missiles started arriving from the sky. Well, it was fun at first. The water was cool. It kind of drenched the people in their chairs. But as the tempo increased, it became very uncomfortable to stand under this barrage. So slowly the townspeople began to retreat out of old Noah's yard and back across the field to their homes. Walking by piles of lumber, the saws, the scaffolding, and with water raining down, a thick curtain of water began to fall. At almost the same instant, the people were stopping with ashen faces, shouting to one another, Is this the flood old Noah was talking about so long? And then a blinding flash of fire from the sky lit up the countryside like noonday. A deafening boom followed, and with terror-filled steps, they all turned and ran to the huge building that Noah had built. Climbing up the scaffolding, pounding frantically on the place where the door used to be. But the thick, sawed gopher wood only absorbed the blows of their hands. And as they looked at their hands, they saw them covered with the gooey, black pitch that Noah had daubed all over the outside of that building. In the alternating blackness and blinding flashes of lightning and the booming explosions of thunder, the townspeople crawled home. Soon the ground began to be covered with water, and all their deepest fears were confirmed. The flood had arrived, and they were wrong, and it was too late for them. Wouldn't it be awful to be outside the ark instead of inside the day the flood started? Let's read about it. Chapter 7 of Genesis, and I'm going to let you listen to the only flawless eyewitness account of this most amazing moment in history. Let's listen to God, and let's ask him to teach us about the lesson of the ark. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark. It's the first time the word come is used in the Bible, and it's interesting, God uses it. He invites them into the ark, very significant. You and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation, and you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and a female, Two each of the animals that are unclean, a male and a female. Also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth. Forty days and forty nights. And I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. By the way, where we get the 120 years is that he was 480 when uh, the Lord told him to start building this thing. So it lasted 120 years. Verse 7, So Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and their three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, and every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. 
So these that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded, and the Lord shut him in. Very significant. Verse 17, Now the flood was on the earth forty days, and the waters increased, and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. And the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the hills, all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. By the way, as I'm reading this, did you know that God is trying to give us the impression this covered the whole planet? Did you know that? Just like God is trying to give us the impression that he created the whole earth in less than a week, and he did it recently. And someone said to me this week, what about all the science? I said, well, I, there's a lot of science, but God tries to give us the impression that he flooded the whole earth and he created the whole thing in six days, and I'm just dumb enough to believe what it says. So doesn't it sound like the whole earth? I mean, every high hill uh, under heaven, everything was covered. And verse 20 says, the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And what that means was that there was enough water uh, depth so that the bottom of the ark would not scrape on any mountaintops. And so that's pretty significant. Verse 21, And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air, they were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, what a sobering part of your word to listen to. You were the only eyewitness of this scene. Noah and his family were inside. They didn't see the destruction. They did not see the waters prevail. They just knew it was happening. But you recorded this moment for us. The destruction of all the inhabitants of the earth because of their unwillingness to even acknowledge you. Lord, I pray that we will learn the beautiful lessons, the hope, the assurance, the comfort, that is in the ark for all who will cling to you, O Christ. And I pray for those who are still outside the ark, who are, as Mr. and Mrs. Scoff are sitting there wondering what all this is even about, I pray that today your spirit will move and before the door slam shut of your grace, that even today salvation might come to the lives of those who will Say yes to Jesus. And we'll thank you for what great things you teach us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. The last time we were together, we looked at the other elements of the lost world. I'm actually showing you six elements of, of this world that, that perished in the Genesis flood. We saw that they were people that had no time for God. We saw they were people who had no regard for their Maker. And then we saw that in the midst of them, God had put no one like Noah. I mean, he was one in a billion. We saw that last week. But this morning, I want you to focus with me. And we're going we're gonna to go all through chapter 7 and, and really pull out some things maybe you haven't looked at for a long time to see that in the world that perished in the Genesis flood, there was no testimony more vivid to those people than that great big box that Noah built. Every facet of that box points to the Lord Jesus Christ. From, from the initiation of it to the culmination of it, every part of it points to Christ. Uh, if you want to back up for the first uh, lesson, it's in chapter 6, verse 5, because first God had a vivid purpose for the flood. This was a, a vivid testimony of the ark, but, but it was a part of a very vivid purpose that God had for the flood. If you notice in verse 5 of Genesis 6, God said that the wickedness of man was so great that every intent was only evil. And so therefore, look at verse 13 of chapter 6. This is the, the very purpose God had. In verse 13 of chapter 6, the end of all flesh has come before me. Someone asked me, and I've been thinking about it all week, they said, why do we not find, you know, there are five million squashed mammoths up in Siberia, and there are uh, billions of, of fish uh, in the shale beds of, of California. How come we don't find hundreds of millions of squashed people? That's a very good question. 
Verse 13 kind of tells us what was in the bullseye, though, of God's flood. God was not really after the trees. You know what I mean? Uh, he wasn't trying to kill all those mean old turtles, you know, that got squashed up in Wyoming. Uh, he wasn't after the elephant population. In the crosshairs, verse 13 says, of God's targeting mechanism for the flood was, he said, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. I believe that the reason why there aren't hundreds of millions of human bodies in piles like there are dinosaurs and other types of creatures is because God's specific intent with the flood was to destroy humanity. And boy, whatever God wants to do, he does. And did you know there's almost not a single trace other than Dr. Leakey's few uh, Rift Valley skeletons they found, there's almost not a trace of the world filled with people. God said, verse 13, I will destroy them, the people. Now, corollary to that are all the other animals and plants and everything else that were wiped out. But man had become so corrupt, the earth was so full of violence that God had to destroy mankind. Did you know that's why he's going to destroy it the second time? Did you know that? Have you noticed the violence? I mean, just this week, the firemen in Memphis shooting the other firemen, the, the uh, other shooting, I forget where, why. There's so many, you can hardly keep track of them anymore, right? And that's just in America. And if you know anything going on, the Basque now, or today is an election day in Spain, and they're having, they have 20,000 policemen trying to protect everyone from the Basque bombers in Spain. And The earth is full of violence again. And not just the people being violent, even our culture and our entertainment is violent. There must be always judgment and death before there can be a new beginning. And perhaps the reason that there are not millions of human fossils like there are of animals is that there was a specific target of annihilation. God wanted to annihilate the human race, and he did it completely. And that's why almost no trace of the lost world exists on the face of the earth. But if you look at chapter 7, uh, verse 1, where we started reading, secondly, not only did God have a vivid purpose, God had a vivid method. Uh, his method was a flood. And he said, if to escape the flood, you had to build an ark. Now, an ark was not a boat. It was a floating box. That's all it was. It was a square box. It was made of cypress wood pitched with uh, bitumen, which was a, a kind of a, a petroleum derivative that oozed out of the ground. Uh, last week I said if you use an 18-inch cubit, it was 450 by 75 by 45. If you use a 24-inch cubit, it would be 600 uh, feet long, 100 feet wide, and 75 feet high. Uh, whichever cubit you want to use, it was a big box. Uh, we don't know how many species of animals there were in Noah's day, but chapter 6, verse 20 tells us, that God says to bring every kind, uh, and uh, it says that God brought them to Noah, uh, and there were three levels, and there was this window uh, just under the roof all the way around the top. And, of course, we know from chapter 6, verse 16, that there was only one door. Uh, so all those are, are uh, the details. The flood itself was caused by the falling of rain and the erupting of water. Look at chapter 7, verse 11. It says the uh, fountains of the great deep were broken up. That word fountain is a, a Hebrew word that's also used for volcanoes. Uh, it's very likely, and, and all over the world, uh, geologists and petroleum people have found often these huge uh, salt seas that are two and a half miles underground when they're drilling. They, they go through them when they're going for uh, oil. And it could be that there were much bigger salt seas that were... Because it says that God separated the water above from the waters beneath. And so it could be in the pre-flood world, the lost world, that uh, it was all landmass. There were no seas as we know it, giant oceans. But there could have been under or subterranean oceans. And when these volcanoes came uh, spewing their molten rock up through those underground seas, they would have exploded. You know, I mean, the, as the water vaporized, it expands, and it would have exploded in geysers. And that's why it says in verse 11 that the, the fountains of the deep were broken up. It sounds pretty awful. And the windows of heaven were open. It, most likely there was this vapor water uh, canopy all the way around the earth. And so that kind of tore loose and came down, and then these geysers came up. It was just a dreadful place to be. 
And we can well imagine the tremendous effects these would have had on the surface of the earth as well as the climate. There would have been giant tidal waves following the eruptions. And what's beyond that, Genesis 2, verse 5, suggests there wasn't even rain before this. It says in Genesis 2, 5, there was only a mist that, that kind of uh, came across the earth. And if that continued until the flood, they had never seen any drops of water hitting them before. And so the whole idea of rain was was uh, very, very uh, unusual for the people, and which, of course, makes the faith of Noah even more wonderful because there were no seas, there were no rains, there were no floods, and he believed in one. But uh, so God used a vivid uh, method, the flood. He had a vivid purpose, destroying mankind, but God had a vivid servant. This fellow Noah, and we studied him last week as far as his family, but he was an amazing man. He presents quite an interesting picture of Christ, and, and I don't want to focus on this this morning. I'll just read it to you. Noah, the name means rest. That's chapter 5, verse 29. And remember, Jesus said, come to me and I'll give you what? Rest. Yeah, so Noah means rest. So he's a real picture of Christ there. God called only one man to save the whole world, Noah, and Christ is the only Savior of the world, right? There aren't many ways to God. Noah was faithful to obey all that God commanded him. Jesus said, I always do the things that please my Father. Noah was brought safely through the floods, and Christ went through the flood of suffering, it says in Psalm 42, 7, and came out a victor. So there's a lot of parallelism between Noah and the Lord Jesus. Noah went out of the ark as the head of the new creation with his family, and when Jesus came out of the tomb, he was the head of the new creation. He was the head of his new family the church. Noah and Enoch together represent Israel and the church. We saw that two weeks ago. Noah went through the judgment and was kept safe like the 144,000 in the Jewish remnant will go through the tribulation. Enoch was raptured before the judgment came, before the flood, just as the church will be raptured out before the wrath of God is poured on the world. But let's go to chapter 6, verse 13. This is where I want to spend our whole time. You might even want to jot some of these things down. I want to show you the vivid lessons of the ark itself. Now, I quickly talked about the flood. We're going to do that more next week. We're going to talk about what happened and how we find all the animals and the dinosaurs and all that in the days ahead. But I just want to look at the box this morning with you. And we're going to, we're going to look at seven facets of the box, the ark itself and see the richness of the imagery and the typology of the ark that show that Jesus was foreshadowed in that box. And you may never have thought of this before, but I hope you'll see it as we go through this. Number one, uh, Genesis 6, verse 13 and 14a, uh, say this, uh, And the Lord said, The end of all flesh has come, I will destroy them. Verse 14, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, and on and on is a description. What's amazing, first of all, is that true salvation is divine. And the ark pictures the provision of salvation in Jesus. The ark, like salvation, was planned by God and not invented by man. What do I mean by that? Well, God said, I'm going to destroy the world. Noah didn't say, hmm, let's see. So I missed the destruction. I think I'm going to build a boat. He didn't have any idea of how to get out of the destruction. God initiated the plan. Do you understand that? It was God's idea. The ark was God's idea. Salvation is God's idea. It's not ours. And religion is our idea. We think we're going to uh, avoid the wrath of God by religion, but revelation is from God, and God says, this is how you're going to escape the wrath. Now listen to what Jesus says in the New Testament. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Did you catch that? God says, you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you. Ephesians 1, 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Did you know every time God talks about salvation, he talks about it like it was his idea? Did you know it was? God initiated the plan of salvation. God told Noah to make the ark. The ark not only saved mankind, but the creatures within it. And just as Christ's death will one day deliver creation from the bondage of sin, it says in Romans chapter 8. But notice the faith that the occupants of the ark had to have. There is no mention of the ark having any sails. There's no mention of any oars. I mean, they couldn't help God out. There's no mention of a motor, an engine, a rudder. There is no pilot house. God directed the course of that boat, that barge. 
They had nothing to do with it. I mean, can you imagine us? I mean, we'd want to have a little, you know, tracker, uh, you know, depth finder to make sure we didn't hit any mountains, and we'd want to make sure we had an inboard so we could steer clear of any... You understand what I mean? I mean, there's a lot of faith going in that thing and, and the whole world getting flooded. Where will we end up? What if we end up in the Arctic or something and starve to death? God's totally in charge of all that. See, what a picture of salvation. But the second picture, look at the end of verse 14 of chapter 6. Not only did the ark picture that God initiates salvation, but secondly, the ark pictures that salvation involves a perfect rest in Jesus. This is interesting. You might have missed this. Make yourself an ark, it says in verse 14, of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. We'll get to the pitch part. Make rooms in the ark. It's interesting. That word rooms is literally the word for resting places. Nests, actually. It's a Hebrew word for nest. N-E-S-T, you know, like a bird nest. It says make lots of nests. That's why I think they hibernated. But listen, the ark pictures the provision of perfect rest. God's plan said, construct many resting places in the ark. So Jesus calls all who come to him in their weariness to find rest for their souls. He says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. If you'll come in the ark of my salvation, I'll give you rest. Also, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many resting places. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many, and it's the same idea, rooms or nests. You know, the King James uh, said mansions, but that's because we don't live in a manorial system. A manse, a manse was a, a great home uh, that, that the the person that had the land in the feudal times owned and had it was a very large home and the people that worked there lived in rooms and that's what mansions were, little rooms in the manse. And so the King James said mansions, which to them meant rooms, but to us, we think, you ever heard, oh, I'm going to have this big mansion down the road, you know, from you. It doesn't say that in the Bible. There's one house, my father's house, and we all have a room in it. I mean, I want to be in a mansion. I want to be at home with my folks, you know, my father in heaven. Who wants to live out in a big mansion? See, the idea of heaven is it's our Father's house. And he's built a resting place for us there. And the ark was a prefiguring of that. Well, thirdly, look at the last part of verse 14. Not only was salvation initiated by God, he invented the ark. Secondly, it's a place of perfect rest. Thirdly, the ark pictures the provision of a refuge with Jesus because true salvation deals with the protection of the effects of sin. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, look at the end of verse 14. Cover it inside and outside with pitch. I'm not sure what uh, your translation says. Mine just says with pitch. It's an interesting word. It's the only time it's translated pitch in the Bible. The other 70 times that word kafar is used, that word pitch in verse 14 at the end, is the Hebrew word kafar, which used 71 times. 70 times it's translated atonement. One time it's translated what? Pitch. So you know what it means? Atonement. Atonement means to be daubed over, covered over. So on the altar, when the people put their sacrificial lamb on the altar and its blood had been poured out, that blood was like waterproofing pitch that covered over their sins. Isn't that interesting? So you know what the, the ark was? It was just like a great big box that was atoned on the outside and atoned on the inside. So that the wrath of God, the storm, could not come through it. Well, the word pitch, kafar, used 70 times in the Old Testament. Each time, other than this time, is translated atonement. So there's no place in all the universe to hide from the penetrating wrath of God than under the covering of Christ's blood, is what the message of the ark was. There was only one safe place on the planet Earth. That was inside the atonement that was on the ark the pitch, which was a picture of Christ's blood. And everybody who was inside, covered by the pitch, survived. And everybody who was outside, who didn't rush inside the ark and get inside the covering atonement, perished. Isn't that a picture of salvation? You can know all about it. Your parents can be in the ark. Your wife can be in the ark. Your children can be in the ark. And you can be on the outside. And you can know about it. You can look at it. You can examine it. You can feel how sticky it is. But if you never get in, 
you drown and perish. So the ark pictures the provision of a refuge with Jesus because it dealt with protection from sin. Matthew one twenty one: she shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus saves us from our sins by covering us with his blood. The ark saved people from destruction by covering them with pitch that kept the wrathful flood from drowning them. John 1.29, John saw Jesus coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's like the ark who bore away those who were taking refuge. The pitch was to cover and protect the ark. It's very interesting that there are actually three arks in the Bible. You probably have thought about this. The ark of Noah. Then little baby Moses was in an ark of what? Bulrushes. And what was that ark? It was had the pitch on it, just like this, you know, so it would be waterproof. And then, of course, in the tabernacle, there was the ark that held the the uh, tables of stone. And what's interesting is Noah's ark protected everybody inside from God's wrath. Moses' little ark protected him from the desire of Pharaoh, which was in, actually instigated by Satan to kill little Moses. So Satan's attack was thwarted by Moses' little bulrush ark, and God's wrath was held out by Noah's ark. And in the tabernacle, it's interesting that the law tablets were put inside that ark. And what it was was, as long as you piled blood on the top of the ark, on the mercy seat, and that blood ran down, the nation of Israel was shielded from facing the results of the wrath of God contained in the law. So every ark was protective. The ark in the tabernacle, the blood kept the people from being incinerated because of their disobedience to the law. Little Moses, he didn't get killed by Pharaoh at Satan's instigation, and Noah's family were protected from the wrath of God. So it's interesting, the ark saves from judgment as Christ saves us from the wrath to come. 1 Peter 3, 18-22 connects the ark with the resurrection of Christ. And like the waters buried the old world, it raised Noah to new life. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says we should wait for Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus is our ark. He delivers us from the wrath. So Jesus Christ, like the ark, was the only place of safety. So Jesus is our only place of safety. And as death threatened all in Noah's day, so we all today are guilty. And as the ark in Noah's day was the only place of safety from the coming wrath, Jesus is our only place of refuge from the wrath of God against sin. So the ark, thirdly, pictures a provision of refuge with Jesus. Fourthly, look at verse 16 of chapter 6. It says, you shall make a window for the ark. It's interesting, the ark pictures the provision of a whole new perspective on life. Now, now think about this for a minute. I mean, you've got to take time in this. Where was the window? I mean, I would have put the window a porthole. Like, if you've ever been on a cruise ship, they have it in the sides, you know, right down here where you can look out and see the water. But if, you were, if the world was getting flooded, would you want to see the water? I mean, what a depressing thing to see everything swirling and people going, Ugh, you know, let me in. So where was the window? It was up above. And so where could they see? They could only see up. It's like a whole new perspective on life. God says, don't look at the flood around you. It says, look above. It says in verse 16, you shall make a window... For the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above. So it was provision of a window above. They were looked toward their deliverer, not at his wrath and judgment. And just like the pillar and the cloud in the wilderness made the people look upward at the pillar and cloud instead of outward at the wilderness, so we, as it says in Colossians 3, and take just a minute to flip back to the New Testament, Colossians chapter 3, because Paul underlines this for us in Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, and he says this, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are what? Above. You know, this week on on, uh, uh, Tuesday, I think it was, I was uh, standing there, actually kneeling there next to Sweet Mary Sullivan, and she was actually singing. I mean, singing on Tuesday, now she's singing in heaven on Thursday. Isn't that amazing? But, But we were singing there. And, and the idea of, of that whole time as I was at her bedside in the hospital was for her to get that new perspective. And you know what the new perspective is? Look up. Don't look at the storm. 
Don't look at the trials. Don't look at the devastation. Look up. That's what the Lord wants us to do. And that is the purpose of the ark. To, in this window, to look above. They were to look upward at God. A new perspective. As Colossians 3 says, For your life is hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that a picture of the ark? Their life... Noah and his family were hidden inside the ark. You and I who are saved, the only way of our salvation is not anything we have done. It's the the ark of safety God has built around us in Christ. And if we're in the ark of Christ, we're supposed to set our gaze above. I mean, it's a whole new way to live and move and have our lives. Okay, back to Genesis. Now let's go to chapter 7, verse 1. Real quickly, this is the fifth one. There are seven. We're almost done. Number one is the ark. uh, Pictures in verse 14a that true salvation is divine. It's initiated by God. Number two is the ark pictures the provision of a perfect rest. Verse 14 in the middle talks about all those little resting nests. Number three, the ark pictures the provision of a refuge from sin. The end of uh, verse 14 of chapter 6 says they were were atoned. Uh, Verse 16 of chapter 6 says there was a window above, a whole new looking up at their Redeemer and Deliverer, not out at the judgment. But now number 5, look at seven one. It says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come in. Oh, that, did you know the first time anything shows up in the Bible, it's very important. This is the first time a tone shows up. We just saw with that pitch word. This is the first time the word come is in God's word. This is the first of over 500 times that the word come appears in the rest of the word of God. It was come. It was an invitation. It was not go. God didn't say, get in the ark. That would be a command. He says, come in. Now, if I am standing in a doorway and I say, come in, that means I'm already in there and you're coming in what? With me. If I say, get in the car, it means I'm not in the car yet. If I say, come in the car, it means what? I'm in the car. What does God say in 7-1? He says, come in the ark. I'm in here. I made this. I I thought of this for you. I want to save you. Come in with me. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever thought about that? God was in the ark. He invited them to come in and to join him in the ark. It implies coming to where the Lord is. And the ark was a place of security because the designer and the architect himself was present in the ark with its occupants. God was in the ark, and he says, come on in. And when the last one got in, he reached out and pulled shut the door. Uh, I hope you'll think about that. Because not only did everyone outside the ark perish, but everyone inside the ark survived. And salvation is secure because it is God who invites us in. It is God who shuts the door. You know, these Christians that are always losing and finding their salvation are like people whose ark door is open. And they don't realize that they have a faulty ark because God's ark, he shuts the door. And there's nobody falls out. I mean, can you imagine that? Uh, Noah saying, oh, Lord, an elephant overboard. You know, you didn't. Did you hear about that American flight this week that they had to crank it open and pull in the strap? They, did, they were at 12,000 feet headed toward Vegas or somewhere. Probably shouldn't have been going to Las Vegas. Probably that's the moral of the story. But, you know, they had to crank open the door and pull in the strap, and then they shut the door. That doesn't happen with God's ark. He doesn't say, oh, huh, left the door open, you know. We're going to have to lose an elephant. But look at this. John 6. Now, turn the New Testament. We only have a few minutes. Look at John 6. I want to talk to you about salvation from God's perspective. John 6 and verse 37 says this. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Now, wait a minute. How did the animals get in the ark, and how did Noah and his family get in the ark? God said, come, and the animals went. Just like God said. And God brought them into the ark. Can you imagine if Noah had to be running around, like I said last week, with a big net, you know, going and chasing them all over the kangaroos, and he just got the kangaroos up the door, and the giraffes went away, and he was getting a rope. And oh, Did you know that's how some people think salvation is? They're, they're trying to always keep everybody in, you know, and they keep falling out and getting lost again. And salvation is of God. And God gets him in. And John 6.37 says, Everybody the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me won't fall out the door. I will never cast him out. I don't leave the door open. They don't fall out and drown. Here's another one. Look at verse 44 of John 6. No one can come to me 
unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Remember the pitiful words of the disciples? Uh, while you're turning back to Genesis, go to Matthew 8:25. Here's a great one. I mean, this is such a, a, a beautiful reminder. Matthew 8:25. Uh, then the disciples came to him and awoke him and said, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Uh, they had not yet learned the lesson that when Jesus is in the ship, it can't sink. You ever thought about that? When Jesus is in your boat, it won't sink. And so when God invited Noah and his family into the ark, they were safe, and once they were in, God shut the door. Well, back to chapter uh, 7 of Genesis. Let's finish up. Look at Genesis 7, verse 16. When God invited Noah and his family into the ark, they were safe, because verse 16 says, And the Lord shut him in. God shut the door. Now look at uh, verse 13. Let's back up for a second because I want to show you what true salvation is. True salvation is exclusive. Genesis 7.13 says the ark pictures the provision of salvation is only one way. Look what it says in verse 13. And it says, On the very same day Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and his wife, and the three wives of the son with him, entered the ark, and all the beasts after them, and they all went through what? The one door. How many doors did the ark have? One. One. Why? If you're going to put every animal in the world in there, why didn't he have a front door, a back door, a side door, you know, an airlift some, you know, with down. No, no, no. Because everything about the ark was God's plan. And there was only one door, not many. And the animals in Noah's family did not have multiple entry points. There was only one pathway to safety. And as the Old Testament tabernacle later in Exodus would later be constructed at God's direction to only have one door. You know, God is hung up on this one door thing. I mean, OSHA would not approve of this. You know, there are no exits, you know. God says, no exits, one entrance. You can't get out once you get in. It's one entrance. I mean, that salvation is it gets a little mixed up in some people's minds. You say, why are you saying that? Because half of all people that claim to be Christians don't even know there's only one entrance and no exits. And they don't realize it. God shuts the door. That they, they don't have to. They spend their whole life hoping that they shut the door and they keep repraying the prayer, hoping that they won't fall out. And they don't have a concept about salvation that when you are in Christ, God shuts the door and you're secure forever. Well, the ark shows there's only one way to God, so there's only one way of salvation. There was only one ark. You know, God didn't put a fleet of arks out there and say, pick your boat, you know, <laughs> whichever one you want. Just get in one. It says in John 10, Jesus said, I am the door. One, one door, singular. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. But you've got to come through the one door. Jesus, John 10, 9. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes any other way except through me. Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in the other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Could it even be that the door being in the side of the ark, remember that's where it was, right in the side, points to the fact of the pierced side of Christ by whom we have entered in through his sacrifice boldly to the very heart of God, no matter how guilty or how ruined we are by sin. So there was only one ark. God didn't provide a fleet of ships and say, take your choice. There's one ship available. In our world, there are religions without number, but there is only one way of salvation. And there is only one way of salvation in Noah's day. There's only one door to the ark, and there's only one way to heaven. Well, the conclusion of all this is, Back to verse 16. I want to end there. God, number one, initiated salvation. We saw that. Number two, salvation involves rest. Number three, salvation is a refuge from God's wrath. Number four, the, the salvation God gives gives us a new perspective, a window above. Number five, it's at God's invitation. He says, come. Number six, it's exclusive. There's only one door. But finally, verse 16 underlines the fact that God saves eternally. There is a provision of security because the Lord shut them in. They were hidden in the watertight walls of the ark like we are in Christ. Colossians 3.3 3 says, For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God.
Noah didn't have to protect himself. He rested in the protector. 1 Peter 1.5 says, We are kept by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now look at chapter 8, verses 18 and 19. I want you to see something. Maybe you've never noticed this either. Genesis 8.18, So Noah went out, so he survived the flood. His sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, so they survived the flood. Now look at this. Every word of God is important. Verse 19. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird. Did you notice that nobody failed to survive the flood that God saved? He didn't have a few that got pneumonia and died in the ark on the way. He didn't have some that fell overboard. All who went in that ark came out safely. None were lost. All who entered survived. None were lost. None perished. God preserved them all, and it perfectly portrays the Lord Jesus Christ. While the door was open, any and all who believed God's word could come into that ark. Once the door was slammed shut by God... Nobody else could come in. However, there's a little phrase in the account that we forget. It's the fact that when God put you in the ark, verse 19, everyone survived. Right down to, you know, that means that all the little creeping things, the things we don't like, you know, the mice that run around and the snakes and down to even those things, every one of them. I wouldn't have minded if some of those had not made it, you know? But God says every one of them made it. Well, God shut them in. They were secure. Jude 24 says this, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen? Let's bow before our God. Thank you, O Lord, that you devised the plan of salvation, that you designed an ark that was atoning, covered with pitch, as we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And all who come in at your invitation, whosoever will, let him come, and all who respond are saved forever. Because you have said that you are able to keep us from falling. And you are able someday to present us faultless. Now, we're not faultless today. We still are painfully aware of our sinfulness, our frailty, our failures. But someday, we will be like you when we see you as you are. But until that day, the door is shut and we are secure. I pray for any who today have not yet entered the ark of Jesus Christ, that while they hear your voice, today they will not harden their hearts. And the invitation is always open, and we extend it in your behalf, the name of Jesus Christ today, O Lord, that you would bring to yourself and draw those to you who want to hide beneath the atoning blood of Christ right where they sit this morning. May they say yes to Jesus. Yes, out of my darkness, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness, and song. Into the great forgiveness. We'll thank you for what you do in our lives as we yield to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.